Good afternoon again. We resume our session. We'll have uh, two speakers, uh, remarkable speakers, I would say, with very interesting presentations. Uh, the first speaker would be George Saliba. I don't think he needs any presentation uh, for one of uh, the leading uh, uh, presenters of the history of sciences. Uh, today he will talk to us about the mystery of the decline of Islamic sciences. George, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mustafa. I also thank the Academy for inviting me to participate in this. You can all hear me correctly, this one? Very good. And uh, before I go on, let us, let us not kid each other. There was a decline, okay? And the reason for it is that we have evidence of the decline. There, is, there are people who still deny it up till now. They say, no, 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 we didn't go into decline. Everything is okay. The proof that I have is that we do not have any more in present day, nor did we have 200 years ago, the creative genius of people like Razi, like Ibn Sina, like Bayrouni, like Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi, like Urdi, like Tusi, like Ibn Nafis, Ibn Shatir, Khafri. None of these exist. So there was an actual decline. And this is the issue that I would like to address today with you and hopefully redirect the question and say, when did it happen? It's not that there was a decline or not was a decline. There was one and we would like to know when did it happen and hopefully try to figure out why. And together I think today I would look at the evidence that is usually given. Most people say, well, decline, and if you read, by the way, any literature on uh, either written by uh, Orientalists or even, unfortunately, by Muslims and Arabs themselves, and there is still this poor attack on Ghazali. They say because Ghazali wrote this famous Tahafat al philosopher that killed science altogether in the Islamic civilization, and that's it. From there on, we can sleep happily with it. Then there are, there are people who say there was an external cause of a decline, and then they immediately point to the Mongolian invasion, which devastated Baghdad in the year 1258. And the sources are filled with the literature on how horrendous it was, how horrible, how barbaric, and all of that. And of course they say, how could you expect to have anything after this barbarity has invaded the whole Muslim world altogether. And this is, again, just a, a clear uh, vision of the roots of the Mongol invasion, which in fact did take place. However, if we were to believe that both of those explanations, either one of them, did indeed cause a decline in Islamic civilization, then we have real problems. Problems in the sense that we have evidence that we would not know how to explain it theoretically. If Ghazali, for example, was responsible for the death of Islamic science, then I don't know what to do with the works of people like Jazari, like Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi, like Ibn al-Baytar, like Urdi, Tusi, Ibn al-Nafiz, Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi, Kamal al-Din al-Farisi, Nizam al-Din al-Nisaburi, Ibn al-Shatir, Jamshid al-Kashi, Qadi Zad al-Rumi, Ulugh Baig, Ala al-Din al-Qushji, Khafri, and so on. This is only to list a few, all of them lived and worked and died after Ghazali. So if Ghazali killed those sciences, what were these guys doing? How do I explain their work? How do I explain it in terms of Islamic science? And if the Mongolian invasion did indeed cause this famous destruction, then what do I do with the most famous observatory ever built in the Islamic civilization in the city of Maragha, built one year after the destruction of Baghdad. Baghdad was destroyed, destroyed 1258. The Maragha Observatory was set up between 1259 and 1260. How could that happen if that civilization was totally devastated? Moreover, what would I do 
If this were the case, with the works of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, Urdi, Shirazi, Nishaburi, all of them worked at Maragha and produced the best astronomy Islamic civilization had ever known. This, together with others, like Maghribi, Najm al-Din al-Katibi, and all of those works should not exist if the Mongolian invasion has already devastated the Islamic civilization. Who taught those people? Who gave them the jobs? How did they produce? What conditions they produce? And so on. And then what do I do with the famous work of Ibn al-Fawati, who tells us in his Mu'jam al-Alqab that he had a library brought up to Maragha of about 400,000 books, and in his Mu'jam al-Alqab kept, kept almost a diary of all the people that he met with who came and visited that library, which means that there was a very vibrant intellectual activity taking place in Maragha. If this was the destruction, then I would like another destruction tomorrow to give us a fantastic, vibrant academic environment that somebody like Ibn al-Fawati would actually speak about. So all of this is simply to say that these two explanations do not explain the facts that we have. And as scientists, I hope that we all agree that all theorization, if it is not made and based on the facts on the ground, is useless. So why do we keep thinking in fictitious terms and not account for the facts that we actually have? So all of this evidence begs us to explain it and begs us to reorient our thinking about Islamic science and about its decline and when did it decline. What seems to be clear, and from the names just mentioned that I say, there seems to have been a continuous scientific tradition all the way till the 16th century, despite Ghazali and despite the Mongolian invasion. So these are the facts on the ground, and I'd like to account for them. Something must have happened in the 16th century, and what seems to have slowed down the scientific progress, which we're still seeing up till this very day, it has been slipping after the 16th century progressively till this very day. Therefore, the crucial point is the 16th century, not Ghazali, not the devastation of Baghdad. And the 16th century, we know something about it. This is the century of Copernicus, of Vesalius, and right after in the 17th century of Kepler, Galileo, Tacho, Brahe, and the whole scientific revolution comes after them. The 16th century is crucial because we know a little bit that it was Technically, and here I mean mathematically, technically, in mathematical, astronomical terms, deeply influenced by Islamic science. I have time only to give you a few examples of how deeply influenced was the 16th century Europe, the Renaissance science, how deeply it was affected by Islamic science. This is the model for the movement of the moon inherited from the ancient Greek tradition. And if you notice on the right, on your left hand side, when the moon is supposed to be quarter moon, the Greek tradition predicts that it will be twice as big as when the moon is actually full moon. Somebody like Ibn Shatter in Damascus who died in 1375, a full hundred years plus after the devastation of Baghdad, a full two or three hundred years after the death of Baghdad, he said, Lam yura kathalika meaning as a good scientist said, I have never seen the moon at quarter moon be twice as big. Therefore, I need to account for it with a new mathematics. This is the mathematics that's proposed by Ibn Shatter, as you see it there on your right. Who comes after them about 150 years later? None other than the 16th century Copernicus, who adopts exactly the same mathematics as that of Ibn Shatter. If that was an age of decline, I would like an age of decline tomorrow. These are brilliant mathematicians who are actually solving very fundamental problems and who are actually participating in what now can be called a universal science. What Ibn Shatter produces in Damascus gets integrated into the works of the Polish mathematician Copernicus and you see it in the Latin text exactly as predicted by Ibn Shatter. What do I do then also? This is the 16th century where Copernicus also inherits a very fundamental theorem from Nasiruddin al-Tusi, which the essence of the theorem is to say 
that we can produce linear motion as a result of two circular motions. I hope this works. Yes, watch that, that red point. It goes up and down linear line as a result of two circular motions. I don't have to time, the time to train you into becoming good astronomers and mathematicians so that you will understand what it means to the Aristotelian world when you destroy the relationship between linear motion and circular motion. This very essential theorem was also adopted in, by Copernicus and as you notice, just look at the Arabic text which is proving that theorem Look at the Latin text which proves it over there. Where you have Aleph in Arabic, you have A in Latin. Where you have Jim in Arabic, you have G in Latin. Where you have Dal in Arabic, you have D in Latin. Where you have Ba in Arabic, you have B in Latin. Every single point. If I ask you to draw a triangle and say put A, B, C, you put them anywhere you want. Why do you have to put them in exactly the same positions that Nasir al-Din Tusi had put them 200 years earlier? There was one professor from Harvard who noticed that Zayn in Arabic is rendered by an F in the Latin. He says, ah, you see he's not copying all the way. But look at the relationship between Zayn and Fa in Arabic. They're easily confusable and it is a problem of somebody misreading the Zayn into an F. So what we have is a Copernicus with the help of somebody trying to understand the diagram of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi and making a mistake in reading. This is the 16th century that we know, and this is the material we know, and this is how intimate the mathematics and the astronomy of the Islamic civilization was embedded in it. Joseph Needham noticed the same thing. About 50 years ago or so, he noticed that the 16th century had the Chinese civilization the Islamic civilization and the European civilization were almost all on equal footing. And he raised the question, how come that modern science could rise in Europe only and not in Islam nor in China? His only mistake is that he went back and started trying to find out what was wrong in the Chinese civilization could not produce it. And since Needham's time, we have had every second Muslim who thinks twice or every second Arab who, who thinks three times trying to find out what went wrong in Islam. Instead of redirecting the question, since both Islam and China is not Islamic, by the way, they also did not produce modern science. The question should be what went right in Europe, right between inverted commas now. And I would like to actually begin to think about it and to share with you what I think the advantages we get if we re, re, reprogram our minds away from the prejudices of the last 200 years. What seems to have happened in the 16th century has nothing to do with science to start with, but it has a lot to do with the distribution of wealth and is a major shift in the world organization. Let me give you an example. The world before the 16th century, just the 16th century, was just about what we see in this map. More or less the ancient world as we know it, with the big chunks of Europe, Asia and Africa as we know them, and more or less it was a discovered world. The main trade routes before the 16th century, all of them, like every single one of them, were really crisscrossing all across the Islamic world. You all know the more trade you have, the more business you have, the more culture you have, the more progress you have, and so on. The economy is vitalized by the trade. And what we have here are major trade routes crossing the Islamic world from east to west and producing wealth. And sure enough, despite the wars, despite the interseen fights, the dynasties and all of that, there was still enough wealth to be produced to produce those brilliant scientists what we know. After the conquest of Constantinople by 1453 and with the Ottoman armies advancing all the way into Central Europe, there was a serious problem for any European who is sitting there trying to figure where their trade is going to come from and their resources are coming from. So there, were, there begins to have dreams in Europe 
of alternate routes to the east to re-participate in that trade. And those dreams are materialized, for example, excuse the, the slamming of these things because I'm working from not my computer. This is somebody else's computer I'm working from. One such dream is the dream of somebody by the name of Martin Beheim, who died about 1507. His own vision of the world, look at this world that he has produced on the globe. The one on the right that you, that you see shows at the very edge is the continent of Africa and then a little bit of Spain over it. The continent, the one on the, uh, on the left shows the eastern shores. No Atlantic, of course, uh, uh, no, no Pacific, no continent of uh, America, nothing. This is exactly how Beheim saw it. And this is the world that Copernicus actually inherited. The real world, in fact, in comparison, look at the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. It is almost twice and a half as big as the Atlantic Ocean. And that is the real world that they had to, but neither Copernicus nor Beheim, I'm sorry, near uh, Columbus, nor Beheim ever dreamt that the world is really that vast. Nobody would have ventured to go east if they knew that there is still another Pacific Ocean to cross before you get to India. This is the globe again, as I said, of Mr. Beheims, and this is the globe, the, the map that was also handed by Columbus. Notice in both cases, you have the word for uh, Chipano right in here, which is really for Japan. So they both think that a little hop from Spain in here, you can hit and you are already in Japan. So it is just a little sea called the Atlantic, we can cross it and you will be over the other side. The, the, the uh, yellow lines around the map of Columbus tells us why, in fact, when he reached Hispaniola in Latin America, he called them Indians. He thought he reached India. He had no idea that he still has a continent and another Pacific Ocean to cross. So as a result, the Indian Americans, the poor Native Americans, are still called Red Indians up till today because of a mistake of somebody who didn't know what was the big size of the world and adventured foolishly, and sometimes big mistakes yield something. It's just like when you hit the jackpot. I go back to the trade routes. Look at those trade routes before 1492, before the discovery of the new world, and look what happened after 1492. You see where the trade is going? All across the Atlantic, into the Americas, and once the Pacific was discovered, from the Americas into the Pacific, and very, very little was going through the Islamic world with the Portuguese discoveries around the, uh, uh, Africa. Now you can see they are circumambulating Africa and they are trading there, and the Islamic world was left with no trade. How could they make money? How can you possibly support scientists, support academies, do all these things if there is no money? And if there is no trade, there is no money. This period was immediately followed by something called the Age of Discovery, which very quickly translated itself into, of course, the Age of Colonization. The coats of the colors, I hope, you see with the, all those bright lights, you can't see the colors in here. The coloring of the upper uh, uh, North America, all tagged on to, uh, to Britain, and then uh, uh, Australia, and then you can see the distribution of the world was really redistributed after these major shifts in the trade uh, route. The results of this age of discovery, Mr. Chairman, you will remind me if I have five minutes left, okay? Once you get to the five minutes, I think I still have a lot more than five minutes. The age of discovery produced then say the following consequences. It brought gold and silver back to Europe, literally in tons. Some of the ships that were bringing gold and silver are still sunk around the Florida coast, and up till now there are people claiming whose gold is it. Is it the Spanish gold, or it is the Floridans, or is it anybody who finds it? So there are literally ships of gold and silver that come to Europe. There also came a very important economic addition, which is African and Native American slaves. That is slave labor, that is capital, ladies and gentlemen. 
It doesn't come, if you have to buy it, it will cost you a lot of money. But now it comes free. You just pick up those people, take them in as slaves, and they will work. Then you end up with surplus capital. Who was it earlier who was saying the basis of foundation? It was, I think, Mr. Uh, uh, our friend uh, Farooq al-Baz. He says, if you don't have the excess of the production, you're not going to have a civilization. Now you have excess capital in Europe. And this excess capital also began to realize for the first time that it was generated by dependence on science. And hence, science can be redeployed now to raise further capital. And we see it, for example, with the emphasis on navigational examples, navigational tools, that most of them were also picked up from the Islamic civilization. One brilliant example, for example, is this astrolabe that you see it on the lower right-hand side. It is all in Arabic, but it is copied by the hand of the architect that you see his name, Antonio de Sangallo, over there, who built St. Peter's in Rome. This is the architect from Florence who lived about the middle of the 16th century. He was so interested in this astrolabe that was made in Baghdad about the year 850. Just to indicate to you the heightened interest of using scientific instruments for further explorations as the Europeans realized that they can actually begin now to invest in the science itself if they have the right tools. There were prizes, for example, set in the end of the 16th century for the person who could, who could actually produce a, a tool that will tell us our longitude on sea, which is a very difficult problem to tell. Yet, this is where the capital was invested to create these competitions and to create those prizes. Some of the investments, the very first investment, we, we know about it in the early part of the 17th century, was to re survey all the medical plans of what was then called the New Spain, which is Mexico, in fact. That, for the purpose, of course, of extracting medical plants for purposes of commercial use. Science then began to produce capital. This is how they began to see it. And it no longer seeks the Aristotelian certainty. Remember science before? It was science for science's sake. We wanted to know the truth. That's what Aristotle told us. Now we're saying we want science to make money. Science is a commercial activity, commercial producing activity, and hence we, he, we need to think of it in different terms, and I have consequences for you. Instead of patronizing science, as we used to do in the Islamic civilization, as patrons would give a gift to a person who writes a book on science, now we will produce science as an investment. So you put money expecting to get back a lot more when it comes back to you. And then science itself began to be organized as a business. In what sense do I mean that? The first patent was produced in Venice in the year 1477. The Venetians did not realize how important it is at the time. It was. But very quickly, when science began to have the commercial tone to it, patenting began to be extremely important. So this is part of the organization of the investment. Academies were not organized just to give each other prizes and shields at the end of the day. Academies were there to create a pool of good thinking people. And out of 100 people that I can patronize and leave them to think, if one of them will produce a commercial activity for me, that will fund the whole academy. So those academies were really institutes of advanced research. The first example of it is the Academia de Linche, the oldest academy uh, in Europe, to whom none other than Galileo joined. And hence you have first the brains being attached to these academies. And of course, once you get a group of people together in one place, and you have to fund them so that they don't have to worry about their breakfast the next morning, they will produce for you. Royal societies began to be also proliferate. It's not accidental that the four major royal societies all happened between 1600 and 1650. It is just at that time when the full realization that this enterprise of science needs to be seen and organized 
as a business activity and hence as an advanced research activity, but well funded, mind you. The East India Company is a brilliant example of that. The Crown gave the East India Company a monopoly for 30 years to trade with the East, and the East, I bet you, was defined as East of the Thames River. Anything that is East, the East India Company monopolized it. You have the right for that monopoly. This is translation of this fantastic activity now into business and making tons of money, further enriching European societies in general. And once there was, of course, the British, uh, Academy, the British uh, East India Company, then there was, of course, the Dutch East India Company, the French East India Company, the Spanish East All of them knew that this monopoly is very useful. And hence, we can create that mon monopoly, ladies and gentlemen, is just a different word for patenting. Patents are nothing, or patents, no matter what you call them, are nothing but minuscule monopolies. And that monopolistic system has a moral value, as we will question a little bit. I will give you the example of Galileo himself, the father of modern science, who worked mostly a good number of time. I think he worked at the Venetian arsenal and the commercial navy much more than he worked at the university because he knew there was a business to get. And when he got his telescope and he pointed it at Jupiter and he saw the, the, the moons of Jupiter, he didn't go home and write a treatise and say, there collapses the Aristotelian world because I have an evidence. Actually, he has the best evidence. He didn't do that. What did he do? He wrote to the king of France. He says, I found the new stars in the skies. I'm willing to name them after you if you pay me. The French king said, no, 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 I don't want to play with these things. He wrote to the Pope, he didn't give up. He said, I'll call them the papal stars. Also, the Pope said, it's not my kingdom. He sold them to the Medicis, and he got the full life appointment as the court mathematician for the rest of it. So he was doing it for business. He was not doing it to discover the truth of Aristotelian values or not, or the Aristotelian universe for that matter. He produces something that's called the geometric and military compass, which is a mechanism which we have the likes of it, a whole history of it in the Arab world, and we have also the history of it passing through Michelangelo and the Ross. But this is not the point. He, what he did, he wanted to monopolize it. So what did he do? He sued his own student for infringing on the patent of that military compass. That's the father of modern science. That's what he was doing, translating science into commercial activity. A colleague from Harvard wrote a book. He calls them Galileo's Instruments of Credit. He means every instrument. He used it to raise further credit for it. But that, with the father of modern science, what it did, it crucified, it, it, uh, 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 crystallized modern science as a problem of competing over monopolies. From there, patenting began to be part and parcel of how modern science operates, and I have a feeling that it even orients the research of good scientists all over the modern world. Why not in Islam or China? Why didn't they develop a similar patenting system and hence develop science as a commercial activity? I say there are real reasons. For one thing, in Islam in particular, I don't know about the Chinese tradition on that one, monopoly is kufr. We know that. Man ihtakara kafara. I mean, this is the most common repetition of it. So hence, the idea of monopolizing something will not be condoned. And then we know from the hadith of the Prophet himself, it says, who owns knowledge and he deprives his fellow people from it, he will come at the day of judgment bridled with a bridle of fire. Man alima ilman wa katamahu jaa bihi yawm al qiyamati muljaman bilijaman min nar. So imagine the kind of, 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 of horrible punishment for people who will, ref, who will try to monopolize knowledge and keep it to themselves. These are ethical issues, meaning how far now are we willing? to allow this patenting system to take over our moral values. Look at the history of patenting. As I said, originally in the monopolies of the East India companies, it went for 30 years. 
Western societies themselves realized that this is really immoral. So they began to reduce the dates and the years of patenting. The latest in the United States now is you can only have a patent for a few years, four to five years. If it were morally free, why not give a patent for life? So they also know that there is a moral compromise being done when you allow your patenting to deprive the society from knowledge that is absolutely essential to them. That is where religion interferes with science. Not when Ghazali writes to half the philosopher. It's when religion does not allow you to compromise your moral values and does not allow you to monopolize a, 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 a knowledge that is useful to the society. That is when the price comes in and uh, religion says, uh -uh, we have to be very careful in that. So what do we do with modern Islamic societies? What are the implications of this lesson for us? Now that we know what allowed Europe to actually surge on, can we do the same in Islamic societies? The Prime Minister uh, uh, Mahathir actually has set up in Malaysia a fantastically similar system where with my own ears I heard the Minister of Malaysia for Science, Technology and Innovation says, I don't want scientists to produce science in the lab, I want scientists to produce science for the market. This is a brilliant interpretation of this. Can we do that? Is it possible for Islamic societies to actually resolve this ethical issue? Can we relax in the same way the Europeans relax that ethical issue? I know that the International Juridical Union has been struggling since the 1970s with the issue of intellectual property. And in the, up till now, what I have read so far is that they are arguing whether the intellectual property is a property for you or it is something that can be shared or you have to share. But they haven't come into the next level, which says that property can be sold and bought and capitalized on in the same way patents are done. They have to resolve that and they have to resolve the hadith of the prophet that whoever actually withholds knowledge from society, that person, جَاءَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مُلْجَمًا بِلِجَامٍ مِنْ نَارٍ this is the duty of the jurists. They have to think about it for our modern Islamic world. They have the educate, to adjudicate intellectual property. We have to set rules for it. We have to understand what does it mean, when can it be patented, and if patented, for whose benefit, and for how long, and how we, we tamper it so that we don't kill incentives at the same time. So patenting creates incentives, but at the same time, it has this down, moral downside. How about what the jurists always resorted to when they were in a, in a bottleneck? They always resorted to something called al-maslah al am If I can find a jurist nowadays who can convince fellow jurists that we are in such a desperate situation, that the maslah al am taqtadi, that we have to relax that requirement on withholding knowledge by tampering it by some other reward. For example, to make sure that whoever will be given a patent, that he or she will donate 60% of it back to zakat or whatever to benefit the society. Such techniques, such hiyal in law, are not new to Islamic society. All we need is brilliant new jurists to actually think about it. I hope that I have, now I can conclude, and I think this is the very end of it. I hope that I have persuaded you to stop thinking what went wrong in Islam or the awful Mongolian invasion. They're both awful. There is no doubt it was a devastation, but it didn't kill the activity. I also wanted you to begin to think that this phenomena that we call the discovery of the new world and which necessitated colonialism was not particular to Islam or to China. It is a universal phenomenon, and now it divides the world into the ones who have taken the benefit of lowering that moral bar and accepting patenting and monopolies, and hence instituting a business as a result of it, and the rest of the world who is still struggling on what to do with this monopoly. Thank you very much for your patience.